Hello and welcome to On Air with Elk River Treatment Program for Teens, the residential program of Pinnacle Behavioral Health. I'm Selena Mason, the Director of Marketing and Outreach. Today's podcast was pre-recorded at a conference by Penny Baker, the Director of Clinical Services, and Aletha Howie, who coordinates special education services for the program. Here's Penny Baker and Aletha Howie presenting Empowering Parents to Advocate for a Child with Special Needs. Hello, thank you for joining us today. My name is Penny Baker, and I'm with Pinnacle Behavioral Health, and I'm here with Aletha Howie of Restorative Advocacy, and we're here today to talk to you a little bit about how to help empower parents to advocate for their students that may have special needs. When we decided to pick a topic today, one of the things that really resonated with with both of us is the ongoing needs that we've seen not only in residential treatment but with kids that we've seen in outpatient inpatient and alternative school programming and working with parents during this time period who just really don't seem to understand the role that they can take to advocate for their kid in the school system So one of the things I think, Aletha, that we need to start with, just to make sure everyone is very clear, is kind of where we have to start with with parents in general, of just some basic education of what's what, you know, when we're talking about the education system. I know just from the treatment side, looking at it, it is very complicated. There's so many laws and rights and meetings and so many in terms, just so many things that gets really confusing. So if we can maybe start with us going through some some of those terms just to make sure we're all on the same page and understanding even what we're talking about. Okay. Um, So I'm going to run through some things that I hear from parents um, and even questions I've had myself on just trying to understand this entire system. Um, So I guess first, could you go over, I, I hear the term a lot, IDEA. And I'm guessing that doesn't mean idea. Um, so what what is I, I, IDEA? Individuals with Disabilities Education Act that was um, restructured in 2004 protects all of our children with any disabilities. Um, anything that impedes their learning in the regular education setting is covered under IDEA. Okay, so there's actually federal laws that protect our kids and are part of this kind of whole advocacy program that parents can turn to to help get their kids' needs met? Uh, Parents have so many rights under IDEA. That's the very first thing they need to do is make sure that they are aware of all of those rights. Now, when you say um, everything's covered, like I'm trying to picture in my head, like the, the kids that in... My point of reference mainly is going to be from residential programming or outpatient in a mental health center. Um, And I know we're talking a little bit today more globally for the most Mm -hmm. part. Um, But when you say everything is covered, are you referring to if there's behavior issues, medical issues, mental health issues? Um, Okay. So all of that's covered and protected under that federal law. Mm -hmm. Any disability that impedes the learning of a child in the regular education setting is covered under IDEA. Their protections. Okay. And you mentioned something about parental rights. Like what, can you give me just an example of maybe a couple of rights that parents don't realize that they have? Schools, uh, school systems cannot make any decisions uh, about your child without your consent. Um, you, let, me, let me ask you a question okay. about that. So, because I've seen this happen where a school system just kind of presents a plan to the parents and just says, this is what we're doing, and the parents just feel like they have to be, well, okay, and like they don't have a voice. So what I'm hearing you say is one of their rights is whatever's in that plan, they have to be a part of that plan and agree to it. Is, is that correct? Oh, Yes. They cannot move forward with any plan unless the parent agrees and consents to that plan. Uh, When the plan is being designed, sometimes they will try to get together and make the decisions before a meeting. And they cannot put that in place, though, until a parent 
signs off on anything that they would like to do. And the parent is uh, one of the most important members of the IEP team. Okay. Um, but speaking of IEP, uh, because I've heard you mention that a couple of times, can you explain a little bit, um, again, kind of for if we were kind of as we're working with IECs and and working on how to empower parents, we're going to come across as parents who don't know, you know, some of those terms. So what, when you refer to IEP, what, what, how would, what would be the best way to describe to a parent what, what an IEP is? It's a blueprint, an individualized education plan that is written on paper uh, with federal mandates and guidelines, and it has to be a complete picture of your child. Um, if I p picked up an IEP and I did not know the, the child, that IEP should tell me everything I need to know about that child. Uh, their functional performance, their educational performance, their everything about that child should be in the IEP. If there's a weakness, their strengths and weaknesses should be in there, and all um, strengths and weaknesses should be addressed in the IEP. Okay. One of the other things you mentioned was uh, you, a couple of times is that there's a meeting. Mm -hmm. So when, so this IEP meeting, who all, who all would attend? that meeting? An IEP meeting uh, legally has to be parents, regular ed teacher, special education teacher, a local education agency uh, director, and someone that can interpret test results, and a special education teacher, the case manager. Can anyone else attend that meeting? Like if the parent wanted someone else to? The parent can take anyone to the meeting that they would like to take. Um, and it's in, in, if you feel a little uncomfortable because you're going to be at a table with 10 people from the school system, please take your f a friend that knows the law, an advocate, someone that knows everything about special education. That makes sense. Well, I, well you know, I know um, like over the years, um, whether it's been as part of a treatment program or outpatient counseling. Um, as a therapist, I, I've been invited by parents mm -hmm. uh, who seem to be very savvy and knew kind of what their rights were, um, but also knew that going into an IEP meeting that they were afraid of being outnumbered and intimidated. Mm -hmm. And for me specifically, the 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 kind of identified need um, was a mental health need and they were worried co going into those meetings because there is you know unfortunately still a very big gap and a lack of understanding of mental health right. issues at times and behavioral health issues that the parents you know invited me to go to the meeting to help them help the team understand the significance um, or the severity of their mental health issues or behavioral health issues that was beyond what would just show up in the testing that was given. Yes. So, and they um, need that. They need that understanding. Okay. So, but that's okay yes. for a parent to, and if there's other people they have that work with that kid that they feel would be a good advocate, can parents invite those people to that meeting or does it have to... How, how would that invite come about? The parents can invite anyone that they would like to invite to the meeting. Uh, and they just need to, ahead of time, let the, let the school know that you will be bringing guests and their titles. Okay. All right. Um, any other rights that you can think of that a parent has that um, you feel is pretty important? Oh, yes. You can go into an IEP meeting and uh, not agree with the team and uh, reschedule the meeting, adjourn the meeting. Um, you are the most important expert at the meeting because it's, it is your child. So uh, most parents know the child's weaknesses, their strengths, and, ha and the team has to get input from the parents before they write a plan for the IEP. Before they write that IEP, input from the parents has to be received. But I think a big thing that I I'm hearing from you, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that even when there's an IEP meeting and all of this information is gathered, until that parent is satisfied that the needs of their child is being met um, and signs off on that plan, um, it's not active. That's right. 
Okay. Now, I, I want to back up a little bit because there's another question that I have that I think would be important for parents to know is how would you, like if you're a parent and you think your kid's struggling in school and you think that your kid might need an indiv individualized education plan, mm -hmm. but the school hasn't identified that, how would you go about that as a parent to advocate for your kid's needs? Like, request what do you do? It. Who, would, who would you request that to? You can re request it to anyone in the school. The best person would be um, the counselor. Um, they usually pass on that referral. But if you make a referral for your child to uh, be tested for special education services, they have to honor that referral. And within 15 days, you need to get a call back, and there's a meeting after the referral. Um, so the day that you make the referral, and it's best to make the referral in writing, the timeline starts that day, and the process, all you have to do is request it. So if a parent requests an IEP, they have to respond to it? Well, if you have not had an IEP, you can request an IEP meeting at any point in time if you already have an IEP. If it's an initial referral, um, the school system has to start putting things in place. But if a parent requests an IEP, the process starts the day you make that request. So keep track of all contacts that you make with the school system. Um, every date, every person you talk to, what you say, and keep that in a notebook, start your process, um, because they will keep their documentation. And that's how you get services for your child. Okay. Now, I don't want to complicate this, but another term that I've heard before, and I know I've gotten it confused, um, so I think it's important maybe for our parents to understand or how to teach parents. What exactly is the difference between an IEP and a 504? Like I, I, like I always sometimes use those terms interchangeably and I know I've done this long enough that I know they're very different things, but can you maybe help me understand? Cause there may be certain kids that need a 504, certain kids that need a, an IEP, and I guess parents would need to know which one to advocate for. So what, what's the difference? So uh, 504, is also covered under IDEA and the protections under a 504 are you have the same protections but all services will be um, given in the regular ed classroom in other words um, if your child is having problems in the regular classroom the teacher can make accommodation the regular teacher can make accommodations but a 504 child will not be seen by a special education person throughout the school day. They will not be taken out of the regular ed setting for services. They get services in the regular education classroom. So the biggest difference between a 504 and an IEP is who provides the service and where the service is provided? Mm -hmm. Okay, that helps helps me understand. Thank you. Um, and even a child with a broken arm can get a, fi a short 504 plan because they've got a problem that's impeding their learning for a short period of time. So if they can be taken care of in the regular classroom, then a 504 would be appropriate. Okay, so like you said from the very beginning, this really does cover any need that your student may have um, that will help them meet their education needs. Legally, a school system has to provide a free, appropriate public education for all children. So children with disabilities have to have the same rights as any of the other children sitting in the classroom. And whatever services they need, ask. Keep your documentation and ask. One of the questions that, just I'm a little biased because I'm coming at it from the treatment side, treatment standpoint of, you know, uh, treatment programs or um, our outpatient practice, but I really want to focus a little bit on residential treatment. Okay. And get your thoughts on how this advocacy piece should work and what a parent should do when a kid maybe um, needs to spend some time in a treatment program. 
So if a kid is, um, and just for the, the purposes of our kind of training today, mm -hmm. I'm going to be specific to a, a certain program um, and kind of even how we met each other of you doing services for a program that I'm involved okay. in, um, just for the simplicity of examples. So we have a kid that is admitted to the Elk River Treatment Program. And I'm going to go through a, a few different scenarios. Okay. Here's the first one. When we're looking at a kid that's admitted to, let's say, the Elk River Treatment Program, mm -hmm. and we have a kid that, for some reason, has not been identified, but we obviously see with all of the assessments that we've done coming in for admission, whether it's the mental health assessments, the behavioral assessments, the academic assessments, and we see that there's definitely some deficits there. Um, so we identify a kid that obviously has needed services, somehow is missed. What can we do for that parent to go ahead and set up that process to advocate for their kid that was missed, that transitioning from residential treatment back home is definitely going to need either a 504 or an IEP. What are the steps that they can take at that point? Uh, number one, child find, which is a federally mandated law, was missed by a school system somewhere at some point in time. Um, so you, at the program, I know there are already accommodations and modifications in place for all children when they go to the program and you know what has worked. If they're successful there. Then well, we've been very fortunate because you, yes. you typically give us guidance on how to provide those accommodations even if a kid doesn't come in with an IEP. Even though it's a different setting than a regular school, the regular school system can put all of the accommodations and the modifications that we have in place. And if that's what it takes for the child to be successful in a regular school setting, they have to do it. So we would make sure that the parent knows at time for transition that they notify the school system um, that their child will be coming back to the school system and we and the school system needs to make arrangements um, and set up and the parent can go ahead and refer the child and the process can begin and during the referral process um, the child is protected so if you refer your child for services, they are protected during that time until all of the testing and assessments can be done to determine whether or not they qualify for an IEP. If they're coming from a treatment program, guess what? They qualify for an IEP in a regular school setting. Unless before they went to treatment, they were making stray days in school, but their life it was in complete turmoil and they have to go to treatment, that's usually not the case. Um, more than likely, the issues that, that sent them to treatment or got them in treatment was also keeping them from uh, their education. So we would just make sure we prepare the parent for that process to go back and I would attend the meeting if they needed me. I've done that before. Okay. Well, I know you've helped several of our students kind of in those situations that were identified that that needed that and help walk the parents through through that process. Um, unfortunately, not everyone has you. Um, so that's um, why I think it's even more important of, you know, looking at kind of what you talked about that, you know, if a kid was having issues in school prior to treatment, and they're in treatment that they should automatically qualify. It's mm -hmm. kind of what it, did I hear that right? Mm -hmm. Should. Mm -hmm. So the parents then would go through the same process you started from the beginning is it's just communicating, and I think you recommended the counselor of the school, mm -hmm. of communicating to them, I'm requesting um, my child to be evaluated for an IEP. Mm -hmm. so, you can also uh, refer to a teacher, a counselor, a principal, an assistant principal, anyone that you would like to re make that request to, who you feel comfortable with, just request it, write the date down, or put it in writing. 
It's well, best you put it in writing. You keep saying that a lot. Um, so I'm guessing that's probably pretty important. So Special education and timelines are very important because the federal government sets up, you know, they set the law. You have so many days to take care of this referral. It's 15 days and the school system has to respond to your referral. Um, if they accept the referral and you're going to be tested, then I think it's 45 days and the testing has to be completed and they need to have a meeting and there needs to be another meeting and then so that sounds like it could get pretty complicated. Yes. So I guess that's another reason you're really pushing for parents to maybe keep a, a notebook oh. where they keep who they talk to, what day, if they sent emails, and keeping track of all of that. One, to make sure the timelines are being met. Mm -hmm. And when they go, I guess, go into those IEP meetings, um, I guess they should bring their notebooks with them oh, yes, in should. case there's any question. And then you also had mentioned earlier knowing their rights so making sure they know what they have the right to ask for and having their documentation the other question that i have though you know when they're in a treatment program there's lots of services especially residential treatment it's around the clock they're getting a tons of services um you know are there limits when it comes to like an IEP when a parent goes into that meeting and they're advocating for their kid like what are the related services that that they can even ask for um, when if, it comes to that IEP meeting if your child was in the treatment program and getting any kind of therapy counseling therapy psychological services um, whatever your child needs and it's a related service there's occupational therapy physical therapy speech therapy counseling psychological services um, the list goes on and on and on and on if if that's what it takes for your child to be successful they have to provide it they don't have any other way around it so if I'm the parent sitting in the IEP meeting and it's been identified, maybe in their residential treatment program that they came from, that that speech therapy was real important. It was something that they needed. And I was advocating in that meeting for my kid to have speech speech therapy. What what if the school said, sorry, we don't have a speech therapist, you can't have that? Like what is what then are my options as a parent if I know that that's something that my kid really needs to be able to succeed academically? They have to test for those services. There is not, there's not any other way around it. They have to test for those services. You can file due process. So this is going back to what you were saying earlier about the importance of knowing your rights as a parent mm -hmm. and understanding kind of the laws that protect mm -hmm. you. My concern is like, it, just from even from the things that you said, that con that process seems pretty complicated. Mm -hmm. um, and I think at times maybe parents become very intimidated by that process and back down from advocating. So what, I guess, what advice do you have for parents who are genuinely trying to advocate for an actual need for their child and they're getting so much pushback of what, I don't know, tips or anything that you could give for that parent to not back down? There's a quote, if it's not written down, it did not happen. So the very first thing that I tell parents when I get a phone call is I want to see all of your documentation. Every time you make a phone call, every time the school calls you, if the teacher sends home a piece of paper, um, keep it, put it in a notebook, label it. Don't write on original copies, you know, have little sticky notes. You need a whole filing system. Um, so it sounds almost more like a little mini filing cabinet than just a notebook. Yes, but if the school so system... So keep everything. Uh -huh, and if the school system realizes you know your rights and you are prepared for this meeting, then you won't have very much pushback at all. Okay, so... They're, they're accustomed to parents coming in without preparation and that, you know, they're just trusting the school system to do what's best for your, for your child. So it almost sounds like the best approach to advocating for the rights of, of your of your child and the education needs for your child 
really comes down to being proactive and being prepared before you ever enter the me meeting. Yes. You can make your own agenda, go in with solutions. You know, this is a problem. What would you like for the solution to be? How can we solve this? Who's going to take care of this? When is it going to be taken care of? How is it going to be taken care of? All of that needs to be in the plan. So it almost sounds like the parents should sit down before the meeting and write an IEP. Yes. So they can go in and This is and the problem. Advocate. This is the strategy. This was what I would like to have. And you're not going to get much pushback if you're prepared. Okay. All right. That is good to hear. Now, we talked to, I know I got all focused because I'm a little biased. You know, I like to talk about residential treatment. Um, and I've seen that process be so um, effective just in um, in advocating for, for kids and teaching parents how to advocate with that transition from residential treatment back to home. Mm -hmm. um, I've also seen it on the, on the flip side of where parents have advocated uh, in their IEPs in school, actually for the schools to pay for treatment. Mm -hmm. So I've seen it the other way as well, which I think is very important for parents, you know, to be educated on uh, when it comes to really advocating for their yes. kids' needs. I think that's important. Um, but I don't want to be overly biased and just talk about what needs I have and uh, how I've seen that be effective in residential treatment. Uh, it sounds like from a, kind of the system that you're talking about that this should start with parents long before the teenagers kind of we get in residential when it comes to collecting things or advocating or paperwork. So when... When should a parent start this process? As early as possible. If you notice a, a problem, if you notice if there's a behavior, if the school's calling you and, and your child's just not being successful sitting in the classroom or with their work. Like, are you talking about like, like in kindergarten or yes, preschool, like that early? Preschool. Or? Yes, they okay. test in preschool. Yes. Okay. If your child is delayed in any way developmentally, um, you just notice that your child is... The, withdrawn or you know not playing with the children like all the other kids on the playground start then start then start talking start documenting at that point when you start noticing start it then immediately one of the things and this is a kind of a touchy subject um but it's something that i i've faced with parents that i've worked with from um, working with younger kids all the way through adolescence and early adulthood um, is where you have, as a professional, talked to parents about the need to advocate for an IEP mm -hmm. or the need to advocate with their school system for additional services. That there is still, unfortunately, a stigma there of and i've heard point blank parents tell me well i don't want my kid classified at special ed uh, like i've heard parents over and over say that and what any tips that you have as we're talking to these professionals on teaching parents how to advocate that's one of the things they have to overcome is how do you help the parents get over themselves that <laughs> You know, and I hate to put it that way, that it's it's okay that your kid needs help. And if they're feeling uncomfortable about that, uh, what will be more important? Success, being a successful student and feeling like you're accomplishing and something, or your embarrassment or your guilt or your you know that you think that it's a stigma. For a special to be, have a special education student. Okay. Do you see that just in in your work? Have you I seen do. That? I, I as an educator, I saw that with my children. Mm -hmm. I mean, my my students. And if they did not want me to approach them in the hallway or talk to them when they're in the regular classroom, I did not do that. So usually, those things can be worked out with the parent with the child. If they need help, do it on the side. You know. Here, well, this is what we will do, and I will be in the regular classroom with you. I will not single you out. I will help everyone in the classroom, and you know, so you can take care of those things. Well, that that makes me think of the question: If you're the parent advocating for your kid in that IEP meeting or that 504 meeting, and you're coming up with that plan, 
if you have a concern about how your kid would be treated if they're receiving special services or being pulled, can you, can you advocate as a parent to have those things you just mentioned incorporated in that oh, plan? Yes, you, can. you can do mm -hmm. that. So if maybe, you do not want the the teachers calling on your child or being um, you know zeroed in on and you know bothered, you can write that in that plan. Anything you write in the individualized education plan ha must be taken care of. So there are ways if that's an issue for the parents that we can educate them. Of here's a workaround yes. you know if that's a struggle for you here's how we can protect yes. that so all that can be included in the plan mm -hmm. wow wow that's very interesting anything they need to be successful in the regular education program can be written in that plan and it must be followed through with so here's so far what I've um, I've learned from you today and thank you very much um, even working with you with all these years, I've um, learned even more today. Write everything down. Start early. Anything you notice with, with your kid, if you identify that they need something to help them with their education needs, start documenting it earlier. Mm -hmm. Keep it a file. Don't write on your originals um, because you might need those. Keep a timeline. Um, be okay speaking up. Yes. As you know, we have school systems that pay for the treatment program. Mm -hmm. If they have exhausted all other efforts in the school system to educate this child and they're still not being successful, and that's the only other place that they can go, we have school systems that call and say, you know, will you attend this IEP meeting so that we can make sure this IEP will, will fit your program because we would like to send this student to your program. Thanks for listening to On Air with Elk River Treatment Program. If your child has special education needs and you have questions that weren't answered in this podcast, please feel free to contact Elk River Treatment at 866-906-TEEN. That's 866-906-8336. You can also learn more at elkrivertreatment.com or you can send us a confidential email to info at elkrivertreatment.com. Thanks again, and we hope you'll join us next time on air with Elk River Treatment Program.